coming for class, we're not going to make you do the entire prayer service we just finished, so you just be here for class. Hello, hello, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. You got a hard copy. <laughs> okay. It's good to have, yeah, let me get, let me sign it in a little bit so I can get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, what I'm, what I'm going to try to do this morning is um, introduce you to the process behind the book, the content of the book, and then open it up for questioning, hopefully allowing enough time. Um, if you want to purchase the book, I can sign the book, whatever. Um, it's good to be together. I'm a little nervous, okay, because this is the first time I've spoken out loud to a group of people about my book. So it's a little, it's nerve wracking actually. It's real interesting, several years ago, um, I called Will Haygood. If you don't know any of his writing, you gotta get a hold of his writing. He's a great writer. You actually have probably seen some of his writings turned into films. The Butler, for example, was one of Will's books. Um, but anyway, I'm on the phone with Will and I'm talking to him about his book on Thurgood Marshall and thanking him for everything. And, We've been on about 30 minutes, and then I said to Will, I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to take up a lot of your time today, uh, Will, and he says, oh, no, 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 please keep talking to me. I, I've been alone in a room for five years writing the book. So I feel like that. I can relate to that. It's like you go in your room, and you work all alone, and then, then there's people, <laughs> you know, so you've got to deal with it. So thank you for coming, first of all. Thanks to everybody for coming. Let me... Um, let me introduce to you uh, the genius of justice. Um, I've written on my copy, Tim's teaching book, so, <laughs> so that I don't get it lost with the others. First of all, let me just say um, how this project became a book. It started out as a project. Um, I had this idea come to me, and I talk about this in the opening of the book, um, inspired by Brenda, Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson. Um, many of you know her as Amina. Many of you know her as Amina Robinson. Uh, but whenever she wrote her name, she always used all four of her names. Um, and Amina uh, was one day at the art museum. I was having lunch. And I'd, I'd known Amina through the years in many different contexts. Um, and I walk in. Uh, to Derby Court, where they used to serve the meals, right? That's where you go to eat. Some of you remember the good old days. Now we have a cafe, which is also fantastic. But I'm down in Derby Court, and she jumps up from her table, and she comes over to me, and she says, Tim, she said, it's so good to see you. Guess what? I'm a genius, and I'm rich. And I'm like, and, and then she throws herself into my arms. Now, if you knew Amina, you know, throwing herself into your arms is not a thing she would do normally. She, she, had her, she knew where her space was. And when she did it, all 75 pounds of her <laughs> hit me. It's like, oh, hope you don't fall over. <laughs> so, um, but she, she threw herself in my arms. And I said, well, Amina, I've always known you were a genius, but how did you get rich? <laughs> and um, she, she told me that she had uh, received the MacArthur Foundation grant for what's called the Genius Grant, right? She had received half a million dollars from the MacArthur Foundation, and the woman who brought her the check was sitting over at that table with Annette Macy Jones, the director of the Art Museum. So there we are. Wow. Um, and uh, of course, Amina invited me to the table, but that was not appropriate because <laughs> this was their own whole thing. But it got me to thinking. First of all, um, I was over the moon happy for my friend, right? Um, secondly, it got me to thinking about genius, a lot about genius, thinking a lot about genius. And um, the whole concept of what genius is. And uh, it, it's interesting because that was, I want to say, 10 or 15 years ago. So it's been a long time. And so what would happen to me is in the years that followed, I would look at people and I would think genius where you were thinking, well, they're really creative, or they've got a good message to say. I would be thinking about their genius, and what is their genius? And so um, I have a definition of genius in here, and I want to read it to you. It's on, 
you think I know every page of my book, right? It's on page four. I define genius as a character of spirit that embodies the best, or sometimes the worst, of human nature. So geniuses of uh, evil geniuses, right? A genius has a strong marked capacity or aptitude which that person uses effectively and well. The justice geniuses use their excellence to influence and change people, policies, and the times in which they live. Throughout time, justice has been important to our Christian faith and people of all faiths. From the earliest writings of the Hebrew prophets and poets and through the ministry of Jesus and through the ages of Jewish and Christian sages, justice has been a central demand and call of our Jewish and Christian faiths. So in the summer of 2011, I gave myself over during my sabbatical time to the project that I had conceived of, and that was conversations with, started out with 25, and ended up being 53 uh, geniuses of justice. And um, the people came to me in many different ways. Some of them are people that you would know. Uh, you would know their names, or if you Googled them and went to Wikipedia, it would take you hours to read everything that is said about them. Um, but some of them are folks that are pastors and rabbis in local settings um, who just do remarkable work. And um, so these names all came together from various sources um, and I began the conversations. I wanna say one thing, um, and, and I, it's almost an apologetic, because anyone who knows me knows that I work across and with all faiths of people, right? I focused on Jewish and Christian geniuses of justice in this project um, primarily because that's my zone of greatest knowledge and experience, right? So I wanted to be faithful to what I really knew um, and who I really knew um, and the source of all that, the Judeo-Christian faith, right? So, um, and it's funny because I found myself apologizing to Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and others saying, well, I'm sorry you're not in the book but you have to sort of figure out what you can do. 53 is a lot of people. By the way, think about 53 kids you're trying to keep track of in a classroom or any study. 53 is a lot. Um, and I found myself over the course of the summer, um, just as people would talk, sometimes they would recommend someone else that I would talk to. But some of the names, and they're all, the, the names are all on page seven through 10 of the book. Um, Again, some of them you'll know. Dr. Amy Acton, um, many of you know from her work here in Ohio. Uh, Sister Simone Campbell. Uh, I'm reading the best known ones, and you go, well, I don't know that one. But Dr. Tony Campolo. Um, you might know Pastor Shane Claiborne. Um, you might know uh, Aubrey Hendricks or Susanna Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel's daughter. Um, you might know um, there's all these other names that you wouldn't know. Uh, you might know Jeremiah Wright, or Otis Moss Jr., or Otis Moss III. Um, you might know um, John Perkins, who is a leading speaker in the evangelical community. Um, and Sister Helen Prejean is one that you might know. Yeah, so there, there are names that you would know. Uh, congressman Bobby Rush is somebody that I knew, who was the congressman as I like to say, the only person to ever beat Barack Obama in an election. And I don't know why that kid ran against him. <laughs> so, Bobby was a Black Panther. Uh, his best friend was, was shot down, down and killed in Chicago, Fred Hampton. Um, and Bobby went from being a Panther to a pastor. And his story is in here, but Bobby and I have known each other for many years. So anyway, so there's names that you will know and names that you won't know. And what I found in the conversations was, was really interesting. Um, the conversations would, be, would all begin with sort of, tell me how you got to be who you are, right? Um, tell me your story. And, and the con they weren't really interviews, they were conversations. And so the people would begin to tell. It was interesting where they started. Almost all of them started in their childhood home. Uh, but not all, you know, some of them came back around to that but some of them would name events in their lives that happened when they were teenagers. 
Uh, some of the events had been tremendously trauma-inducing uh, and had, out of that trauma, they had reformed and reshaped their lives. Um, some of them had, had come to their experiences um, in uncommon ways. Uh, it's hard to describe, but you'll see how that plays itself out if and when you read the book. Um, but I also want to say there were, um, of, of the 53 that I did interview, there were four that, this is actually kind of funny, because I tried to interview Brian Stevenson, uh, William Barber II, Ibram, Ibram Kendi, and Isabel Wilkerson. <laughs> the stories of those that I didn't interview are just as interesting as the ones that I did, because I came within a hair's breadth of each one of them, and then they ran away. <laughs> so, no, they, uh, it was interesting how, what I found, in all honesty, what happened was they were too busy. Like Brian Stevenson, who's, you know, the, the writer of Just Mercy, if you've seen the movie, has built um, the, what I refer to as the lynching museum in Alabama. Um, and, um, but it's, it tells the story of lynching in America, and he runs the Justice Initiative Project. Uh, Brian wanted to talk to me, right? And his handlers, <laughs> meaning everybody who works with him, wouldn't let him because he was too busy. And he kept trying, to, like he would literally go to the phone and they'd stop him, right? So someday, Brian and I will talk, but, um, and some, some have uh, approached me. Um, Ibram Kendi, um, I, I, this is actually kind of a funny story because he's at Boston University now so I called his department. I didn't have an individual number for him. And um, the young woman, you know, his college students are answering the phone in different departments. The young woman, I said, you got to look him up. She had never met him. She said, that's a name I would remember. She was a freshman. And uh, she said, that's, she looks him up online. She goes, oh, man, is he good looking, right? I mean, it's just like, you know, I hear this, Isabel on the other end is like saying, I said, yes, he is good looking. There's no question. He's a really good looking man. She says, I want to meet him. And I said, well, I want to meet him too, Isabel. So we're going through this whole thing. And I said, put a note on his door. And she says, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to hand the note to him. And I said, is there another way you can reach him in case? You're just like, oh, my gosh, she's got the hots for him. She's 18 years old. And he's, what, 38? Anyway, so, so anyway, so we came really close. <laughs> I get an email back from him saying, I met Isabel. <laughs> I can't do the interview. I thought, I hope she didn't screw that conversation up. <laughs> she was so, anyway, but uh, so again, some of these, some of the, some of the other ones are interesting. Uh, William Barber's church secretary, and he's never at church, if you, in case you want to find him, um, uh, had us all set up, and then he was called away to a march. Um, in Colorado, so it didn't work. But, but here's what happened. Over the course of the conversations, people really opened up. And what I find is people want to tell their stories. You want to tell your story, right? If, you may not think you do, but you do. If somebody takes time and wants to sit down with you and listen, uh, you want to talk. And in the case of some of the geniuses, um, some had survived strokes. They're in their later years of life. Uh, Jeremiah Wright in Chicago had survived a stroke, Tony Campolo. Uh, some were on the edge of not having the memory that they once had and have since crossed over into, um, in the time between these last two years, crossed over into dementia and early Alzheimer's. Um, so there were some moments that we had. Uh, Sister Helen Prejean, who's uh, famous for Dead Man Walking, at first told me she didn't have time to talk, and then I'm in the beach in North Carolina, I get a call from Sister Helen, I got her in my, my uh, phone, and she goes, Tam? And I said, yes, Sister Helen. She says, I really changed my mind, I wanna to talk to you now. And I said, okay, well, I'm at the beach. She said, so you can't talk to me? And I said, no, I'm at the beach right now. It's like, can we talk? So we set up a time, and after all, I said, you know, I would just love to spend time with you. Just, if you ever get a chance to hear her, just her, her Bayou accent is enough to draw you into love. <laughs> so, uh, but she, uh, she said, I'd like to, you to come down here and live with me. And, and I said, Sister Helen, how big a place do you have? She says, I got a room you could stay in. 
And I said, how am I going to explain this to my wife, let alone everybody else, that pastor has moved in with, with sister, right? And she said, well, it doesn't matter. No one's going to ask. I said, a lot of people would ask. And she, she said, it's okay. I said, what about my wife? She says, we got bunk beds. <laughs> so, but again, what I'm telling you is that these conversations were with real people in real time, but they are people who have something in them that is different in relation to justice. They eat and sleep and breathe it. You'll see that with John Ashbery. If you heard him in the first service, you know there's something different about the way he approaches social justice. He's one of the geniuses, um, and he truly is a genius. Um, and again, genius is not determined by what's up here. This is not a Mensa society. Although Jeremiah Wright says, if you form a Mensa society for justice geniuses, can I be the president? And I said, yes, Jeremiah, you can be the president. <laughs> so, so again, all, all the folks in this book are very engaging. And what did I learn? It was really interesting. After 53 conversations, literally well over 100 hours of Zoom conversations that I'm going through and trying to sift through everything, things began to fall in place. And that's really what I want to talk a little bit more about is the content. I told you about the process, but the content of the book is what emerged uh, from this. First of all, if you, if you have the book or um, looking at the book, can turn to it. it. It became clear to me that we start on certain ground, holy ground, let's call it, uh, the ground of justice. And what is, the, what is the foundation of the work of justice? Now, for us as people of faith, um, we may come to it in different ways, but it's scriptural. Um, and Walter Brueggemann, who turned 90 yesterday, I was on the phone with Walter for his birthday yesterday. Walter Brueggemann said it best. When I asked, I asked everyone, what text of scripture um, do you turn to that inspires you to do the work of justice? And Walter's answer was the entire text. And so I'm sitting there with him in his, in his, uh, in his study, and I go, you know, only somebody who's stupid like me would ask the next question. The rest of you would go, he just answered the question, right? But probing a little further, I said, by the entire text, you mean, he said, I mean Genesis 1-1 all the way through the last words of Revelation. He said, justice screams at us from the page of the Bible, every single verse. It is all about God seeking right relationships with us. It's all about God calling us to be in right relationship with the rest of humanity, the rest of the world, the rest of creation. He said, it's all about what is right and what is wrong about the world, right? That's what the Bible is. So I say in here, the ground on which we stand is the text. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've reframed everything. So if you think about reading every single verse of scripture in relation to the lens of justice, like Walter Brueggemann does, and in case you don't know Walter Brueggemann, he's like God's right-hand man. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's written over 100 books. He is considered to be the foremost biblical scholar in Hebrew scripture studies or Old Testament studies, but I would say through the years, I think we could give it to him all, right? <laughs> I mean, he's written in the New Testament as well. Um, and just is as good as gold as a human being. Um, but where does that all come from for him and for the others? For him, it comes from a family in the prairies in Nebraska that his father was a pastor and he tells the story of being the, he and his brother being the custodians of the church custodians of a black church in town, this little town of Tilden, Nebraska. I don't know if anyone knows Tilden, Nebraska, but there weren't many churches in town. There was a small black community that had formed after the Civil War. And he and his brother were the custodians of the church. And he said, we learned growing up they treated us better than my own church treated my father, who was a pastor, and better than they treated my mother and us. This church took us in as though we were family, and 
loved us and cared for us, paid us a, a good wage. And I said, why did they hire white boys to be the custodians of their church? He said, that's a great question. <laughs> and he said, because they wanted the children of the community to, to know who they were as people of faith. So they would invite him to church and revivals. <laughs> so he grows up in this really pretty isolated town in Nebraska, right? And he's, he's warmly taken in to this African-American community that teaches him how to look at the world. I mean, it's an amazing story if you think about it. But again, all of these stories are amazing. Your stories are amazing. That's one of the things I really want to, to, to not lose in my first time of speaking about this. I talk in the book about the 53 and how their stories weave together. But at the end of the book, I talk about 54 and I talk about 55. Who 54 and who 55 are in the geniuses of justice. So I, I will get to that before we leave. But out of these stories comes the ground um, conversation about the biblical faith that we stand on. Um, and so my first section is close to God in the text. Uh, in there as well is Susanna Heschel, um, the, the only child of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, one of the things that um, she said about her dad was that, you know, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath as a religious Orthodox Jew as he was. So what he would do is the day before the Sabbath began is he would put all his books and mark all his books with what he was going to read during the Sabbath because the phone was unplugged, everything was off, and he just was alone with his books and his family. So she said, I would come in and there'd be the table for the Sabbath meal and then the table for my father's <laughs> reading. And he would share, he would bring her into the room with him and share with her readings. Uh, and she said, I learned my faith at my father's table. That's a great, that's a great expression. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this is a guy who, as an Orthodox Jew, became best friends with Martin Luther King Jr. Best friends. And he was in their house. I write about that in the book. That she said, you know, Dr. King was always, whenever he was with us, he would want to sit down and find out what I was reading, what I was learning. Um, and when I'd say, well, I was working on math, he said, let your father handle that. <laughs> so, but, you know, he would be with them and stay with them when he was in New York City. And um, she said he was, he had a heart for children like no one I'd ever met before. Um, and he was childlike in his own connection to other people. And so it's very, very moving for, you know, you have this connection to truly um, the greatest preacher and teacher, in my mind, for justice in American history. I mean, um, so, you know, she's sharing these things. But then there's evidence of that, right? So the book will talk about the way the two of them came together. Um, so, so she's a scholar of more than biblical studies. She's a scholar of, um, of Jewish Christian studies, actually. I mean, she has some amazing writings. I would commend her to you. She's at Dartmouth. Um, anything she writes, anything she says uh, is amazing. And so, again, and then I, the other thing is I found, so I, I interviewed and talked to biblical scholars. That was, that was where I started. And then I found one of the things that kept happening was this doesn't just happen in space, this, 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 this work of justice. It often comes down generation to generation, right? Susanna, Abraham to Susanna, um, you know, uh, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. to his son Otis Moss III, but he got it from his father, Otis Moss, and grandfather, and it goes back and back. So this is generation to generation. In fact, Otis Moss Jr., who is a senior edition, right? I mean, he's 86, 87 now, and was best friends with Dr. King, worked in the civil rights movement, tells the story of the proudest moment of his life was going to the church that his great-grandfather helped build. And it was the first African-American church in that community. And the date on it was significant. It opened months after the Civil War ended so that it was the first church for free slaves in the South. I think it was in Georgia. Um, might have been Carolinas, but anyway, I think it's Georgia. 
Anyway, so, I mean, but they, they, they tell the stories. And the generations uh, are significant. And then finally, in that opening section, I, and I talk about um, the social justice warriors here in Columbus, which is something Brueggemann picks up in his foreword to the book. He says, it's important to know that we have people close at hand who do this work who are significant people. And the question is, do we know them? Do, do we know who they are? Have we met them? And do we listen to them? Do we follow them? Uh, remember, scripturally, a prophet's never welcome in his hometown. <laughs> so um, they are women and men who um, have made a huge difference here. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Some of their names you'll know, some of them you won't know. But they're also, it, it, this is a journey in and a journey out. So let me uh, just say a few more things. Um, I lift up in, I have a chapter called Cold Anger, which is an interesting concept. I don't know how many of you have heard that word expression before, but cold anger is when you take what's burning inside you and turn it into a change piece, right? So, and I give some illustrations of how that works. Um, it's, so you don't just scream at people. Um, you don't just, um, you know, screaming won't make them change. You organize. <laughs> you basically take your anger, focus it, and make change, right? There's, then a, there's a thing on prayer. Um, pray and mean it. Uh, listen deeply. Um, there's, a, there's a piece on, um, you know, uh, opening the gates, which is a whole section on women who um, are some of my favorite stories in the book, actually, uh, that just have made a difference in this time. It, the expression comes from Rabbi Rachel Timoner in Brooklyn, who, as an undergraduate student at Yale, was very aware one cold night that there are gates. And I don't know if anyone knows Yale University. Um, I, I went there for divinity school. The divinity school is up on the hill, but the main university is down in the town of New Haven. And um, so, but all of them are gated sections of the university. She saw a woman sleeping outside the gates, and that night as an 18-year-old said, I will dedicate my life to opening the gates, which by the way is, comes right out of scripture. Um, I don't know that Rachel, as an anarchist, as she would describe herself as an atheist and everything else at 18, um, knew that, she does now. Uh, but again, how do we open the gates? How do we, I mean, it's great to be inside here, but there are folks out there that are not warm this morning. How do we open the doors, the gates? And then uh, moving the needle is another thing. I talk about what, what matters, racism and pain matter. That was a major theme in this project. Um, and it is for my life. Racism, and Isabel Wilkerson says it best, racism is the issue of the skin. Caste is the bones, the skeletal structure of America. And our house has been built on slavery, right? Literally. I mean, we hear these things, well, the White House was built by slaves. It's like, no, the whole house was built by slaves. The White House was one of the houses. But, um, you know, and so that became a very important thing. One of the things I really um, came to realize in the 18 folks who are African-American who are in the book, um, every African-American in this book has come to their experience and encounter with racism from their own lives. And then, speaking of generation and generation, going back and back and back and back, their stories of lynchings, their stories, in Otis Moss's case, his great-grandfather came out of slavery, he was born in slavery as a four-year-old, slavery ended, built um, land that he farmed over a thousand acres, and it was stolen from him by the Ku Klux Klan. They got away with it. A thousand acres. And you ask, how do you not accumulate wealth when you're African American? Well, no one can accumulate anything if it's stolen, right? I don't care who you are and what you do. You can't do that. It was stolen from him. That's a story in itself. Um, so here's his grandfather, who's great grand, wait, grandfather. Yeah, it was his grandfather. So he knew him. It wasn't his great grandfather, who worked this land and accumulated this land and this wealth and all this farming, was the most successful man in his community, 
And his response was, even though they stole it, they didn't lynch me. I mean, think about that. So everybody else, and I just want to say everyone else in this book that's not African American, comes to their experience. Some Jews have experienced anti-Semitism as they share their story, but not a lot brought that up, right? But they all experience their encounter with racism as a learned thing, right? Somewhere along the line, they learned that this was wrong. And so their approach to racial justice is out of learned um, experience. So it's in their head. And I've told my, my sisters and brothers who are black that, you know, if you look at your white neighbors and friends, it's all up here. This is cerebral for us. And if it's up here, white privilege will give me the opportunity to walk away from it. I can put my thoughts on a table and, and walk away, right? But if it's in here, if it's in here, if it's in the gut, if it's in the, if it's in the, if it's in the DNA, it's in the skin, it's in your whole being, you can't walk away from it, right? Color, everything else, right? Anyway, so I, I, there's some real discoveries. Not that I didn't know this stuff, but you know, this isn't just, this isn't accidental. This is evidential, right? I mean, this is 53 conversations and every one lined up that way. So I'm telling you, it's, this has to be something we take into our whole selves if we're gonna overcome race in America. Can't be something that you walk away from, or I went to that march, I'm done. It has to be an everyday experience. So anyway, uh, I'll stop because, I, I'll, I'll stop there. There's other things in the book, you'll see. But the 54th and 55th, I won't stop. 54th is the other. I talk about the other at the end of the book. The other is the person that we have no name for because we've never, really stop to pay attention to them, uh, but they sleep outside our doors here at First Church at night. Um, they are everywhere on the streets around us, and I tell some stories in here about the other. Um, and there's a genius in each one of them that I've encountered that has guided them to the work that they do for justice off the streets and out of their poverty and pain, uh, but also calls us to do as well. And then finally, the 55th genius is you, you know? As I say at the end, you know, if you've read this and you've heard these stories, the real, the real reason I wrote the book is for people who say, I can't do that, it's too hard. Uh, it's not too hard, we just have to do it together. It gets easier the more you have. So anyway, I'll stop there. Any questions or, remember, I've never talked about it out loud before, so it's, it's sorry if it's disorganized, yeah. Yes, I please. Think yeah. About this yesterday. Yes. Yeah. So I'm I lean Democrat and that matters because this word woke that we now hear all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I haven't paid attention to it, but knowing that the voices I'm hearing now, who, you, who are using that word, I know they're using it against somebody like me. Right. Right. So I never really thought about it, and then yesterday I came across that the word woke actually is down from the 1960s civil rights stuff. Huh. Um, and I think this counteracts that because. Huh. Woke is being aware of social injustices, is what I just read yesterday. And um, there's a lot of brilliance and intelligence in the homeless community. And right. I, now I'm starting to piece together that being anti-woke is being racist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and anti-mental health. Right. Because right. of all of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorting through the, the almost institutional racism that, right. that but, they, but then people who are in poverty, which right. I would argue that some people prefer that lifestyle, having worked in permanent supportive housing for a right. year. That was too, too challenging of a job for me. Huh. But some people like the street life. Right. Um, and maybe it gets them out of the institutional racism. I don't know the reasons behind that. But I feel like you're pointing out the genius needs to be the counter conversation to the woke conversation. Well, and, and uh, yes, okay, good. <laughs> so the one, one thing I've, I've found with a number of our neighbors and friends, hopefully, that are outside the walls that live on the streets, is when I, when I think prefer that, that sounds too stark, but, but their experience inside what we call home has been so traumatizing that to be inside a space brings nothing but fear and trauma. 
And yeah, I, I guess I would say there's a freedom uh, that when I think of last night or today, you know, I think, is that really what you want? And no, but I can't do the other, right? And so how hard is that? You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of lovelessness in homelessness um, and a lot of pain that comes from that. Yeah, anyway, so questions? Yes, Emily. Um, I just wanted to make the comment that the, um, the man who was a pioneer and cleared Upper Arlington, uh -huh. there's a whole book about, yeah. about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't remember his name right now, but yeah. um, all of that Upper Arlington was stolen from his family. Well, and that's beginning to come out because the story begins, oftentimes the story will begin like, oh, you know, we give tribute to this African-American man who cleared the land and formed Upper Arlington. And you ask, then why are there no African-Americans here? <laughs> so that, that, then that, oh, oh, don't ask that question, right? Well, that's because the land was taken from him after he cleared it. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's stories within stories is the point I'm trying to make is that um, yeah, I mean, there's, by the way, I, I received one of the most beautiful, it's interesting because, you know, all of the geniuses now have the book, right? I've mailed it out, although I found that one got returned, <laughs> so I have to check the address. But um, I've, the, the comments that have been coming back have been very touching because they've come from uh, African-American um, folks in the book. And I, I'm very emotional about this because they are just thankful that I, I got them, you know, and that I, that I understood their story and that I shared their story as they would want it shared. I had a very uh, powerful moment at, in Orlando. One of the people in the book, in the chapter called Math Matters, which if you know me, you know was the hardest and easiest chapter to write because math doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it's like, so the fact that I discovered that it actually does matter for all of you mathematicians going, oh my God, I can't believe he just said that, it doesn't matter. So, um, but these guys just lit my fires, right? Um, Hodges uh, was the one, and, and Ralph Hodges, six foot six maybe? I mean, just a very tall man. Um, and I come up with, to him with the book uh, African American pastor in Richmond, Virginia, uh, grew up in. His father was a scientist for NASA and um, and a mathematician. He said we would read Bible verses and do math problems every night at the dinner table. Right, growing up, and so he loves math and loves the Bible. <laughs> so he makes it work. But um, anyway, he. I walk up to him and I'm literally looking up to Pastor Hodges and I said, "Here it is." And he looks at me and he starts crying. And he said, you did it. I said, well, you know, I did send you emails telling you I was doing it. <laughs> you know, that's what's going through my mind. I said, yeah, it's done. And so I turned to the page where his story begins and he starts crying more, right? And his father was his hero. And he's never seen his name in print in a book. And there's his father's name right beside it on the same line. And he says, you have no idea what this has done for me. Um, and so, you know, I thought that made the whole project worthwhile. I mean, that moment. So the, the book is, you know, it's the genius of others. Um, and their inspiration, I hope, will inspire you. So it's, it's a good book for them. Yeah. Can I ask one other question? Can you yeah. make any correlation between the, the Jewish community and Mitzvah? And where, how that's the same in Christianity? Or where that connection is? Yeah, I mean, that some of you who know me well know that I, I'm absolutely convinced that whoever came up with the Nike um, phrase, just do it, was Jewish. <laughs> it's like, you know, my experience with, uh, my wife is Jewish, and for, so I don't know if you all know that, but my wife is Jewish. So I spent a lot of time in the Jewish community. And it, it's just, it, it's a community that I've found this just steps into justice and gets things done, right? Um, as a community. That, it, it, watch out whenever you, you know, say one thing for all. That's a dangerous thing to do. But in this book, I will tell you that um, the mitzvah or the blessing 
they would say that the blessing is that they're able to do the work. I would say that the work that they do is the blessing, right? So in other words, they just see the ability or the opportunity to do good is the blessing. As I said, I see that they are the blessing. So um, anyway, and, and I, many of them are authors too. So, you know, as you read them, I had a whole other section that my publisher said is, um, it, which talked about their writings and everything. Spent a lot of time on that. Publisher says, if you put this in, it'll drive the price of the book up three to four dollars. I thought it cost too much already, so so I dropped that. But I've got a whole uh, listing of everybody and and much more about each of them um, in the what would be the um, I guess the bibliography of the book. So anyway, okay, thank you. And uh, I know some of us have to get to church at eleven, and some of us want to go home and go sledding, I guess, I don't know. But uh, I will be happy to sign books that have not been signed and uh, let, let me close with a prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to be together today. Thank you for each of these geniuses of justice in this book and each of the geniuses in this room who do your work of justice, who do your work of compassion and mercy and live each day with phenomenal gifts that they share with people in so many different ways. Thank you for everyone here and the genius they bring to life and to living, to faith, and to the works of justice and mercy. We pray a blessing on each of us this day and all of us, all days. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you. Bye, Jeff. <laughs> um,